Oh, thank you, Patricia. And uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. So uh, I'll be explaining a little bit, uh, a brief summary of our uh, farm tool. Uh, it's been uh, uh, pretty wide uh, used uh, in our user community. And uh, I will briefly describe how we built this data set from the technical point of view in terms of modeling, and then uh, put some emphasis on what we consider some extra feature that we offer in this uh, product farm, uh, which is the calibration tool that we offer on it so that you can combine measurements with our data set in order to improve results. And uh, we will briefly describe or show some accuracy uh, metrics regarding how uh, good or how bad you can expect and uh, this uh, when running the calibration tool in this uh, product. So uh, briefly, uh, what is our farm product? Our farm uh, uh, data set, uh, it's um, mainly designed on what we consider the, the center stage of your development. That, so the design uh, phase of your project. So we are not working out a pure prospecting tool, neither an operation uh, uh, our maintenance data set, we are on the design phase here. So basically we will be focusing on uh, this product is designed for layout design, AEP calculation already on a kind of advanced stage of the, um, uh, of the development of the wind farm. So um, uh, we basically, uh, as, as the rest of our products, we use um, reanalysis data sets as an input condition of our model. We use the WORF mesoscale model. It's a meteorological model so that we can improve and uh, the reanalysis information by combining the meteorological information uh, from the reanalysis data sets, such as ERA5, MERO2, CFSR data sets. We can improve these data sets by uh, adding uh, resolution thanks to the mesoscale model when you combine uh, resolution, um, uh, sorry, topography and roughness information from the surface and uh, you solve the navier stokes equation thanks to the uh, the mesoscale model worth, and we basically can, can uh, let's say, focus on different resolution targets. In this case, we will focus on a high resolution uh, final grid because we want to generate a high resolution field that describes the site in terms of uh, wind uh, assessment. So um, we basically run the worth model at a high resolution for this farm product. We use uh, a final grid that it's most of the times is 100 meter. We also offer uh, 300 meter for really large extensions, but mainly we use 100 meter. It's a pretty high resolution for the WORF mesoscale model, uh, which is almost micro scale, right? So, and uh, we generate large extensions, so it's about 4,000 square kilometers. Uh, so it's um, so so it's pretty, let's say, um, uh, accurate description of the wind field. And the main deliverable, it's uh, already built in a format that can be directly used by the wind resource departments. So we, we generate wind resource grid files, so we WRG files uh, that uh, are available at any hub height between 50 meter and 300 meter hub height. And it contains, of course, a summary of the wind speed statistics in sectors and uh, viable parameters. So that's what a WRG file is covering a large extension on the order of uh, a few thousand square kilometers at a high resolution grid. So every one, every every 100 meter points, you can have the wind statistics for the long term, so that it can be directly used for AEP calculations, turbine layout design. Uh, so so and, and also there are some extra metrics that we offer in this farm. Uh, for example, the VREF calculation, an estimate for the. 15 year maximum 10 minute gas that you can expect and also some extra information about turbulence intensity in terms of uh, uh, TI curves and by sectors and also shear, for example. So uh, so it's, it's a pretty compact deliverable where we offer wind speed statistics at high resolution uh, over a wind field directly to be used in WinPro, OpenWind, WindFarmer or other platforms. So uh, I will put some emphasis on an extra thing that we offer on this uh, farm product, it can be calibrated. So, so of course, a WRG file can be calibrated by using certain uh, different tools on the user side, but we consider it, it has some added value if we do that, is this calibration on our side. And uh, well, what is the motivation for this and the reasons for this 
uh, re this calibration of wind resource grid files to be done on the vortex side. So, um, I mean, the reasons for going into the firing calibration, what we call a remodeling, uh, are that, of course, we know that uh, any mesoscale model or microscale model uh, that starts from the from scratch from the reanalysis data sets where there are no measurements available from the customer, of course, there are some biases. Um, we need to correct that. Uh, there are some extreme events or, uh, you know, uh, let's say these parts of the distribution of the wind speed that are in the calm section or in, in the extreme winds, in the, in the high wind speed bins, models usually uh, miss this information. They are not able, the models are not able to generate such detail in the wind speed modeled data. So we need to account for and correct this. And also the viable parameters, uh, you know, this Q, it also, it's related to these extreme speeds. Usually this shape parameter on the variable uh, distribution is not properly captured by the model. So, and of course there can also be some wind direction shifts, small deviations that are not properly captured by the model. So we want to correct this. And of course, um, we want to do that on our side and not on the user side uh, because we want to correct uh, wind speed magnitudes and not distributions. And WRG files already have been assuming certain things such as the number of sectors, the viable fitting, and uh, other limitations that are not really uh, full, uh, let's say, um, physical magnitudes. They are more on the mathematical wind distribution summary. So we want to apply some method that takes into account the variability over the region. This is a, just a snapshot of the wind field over a site generated by our farm. And we want to calibrate this, this, this information uh, by using certain uh, Metmast. It can be one Metmast or more than one. We want to learn a little bit what is the correlation between the different uh, sections of the terrain. We want to see whether one of the Metmast maybe has more impact on the correction than other ones because it's more representative of the area. And we can uh, use the terrain information for this and also some wind patterns that we have available in the model so that we can uh, understand a little bit more how uh, strong or how, uh, how, how large the impact of the correction for each of the metmas should be, right? And uh, this is something that we consider that it's more powerful if we do that in our side, because we can correct the wind speed components. So the UMV, so, that, so that's the, the, the both wind speed components instead of correcting uh, sectors or viable parameters that are a little bit more limited just because of some mathematical artifact. So on one side, we have our model results, high resolution wharf downscale products from ERA5. So that's, it, this is the wind field, wind field generated by the model without taking into account any data set. And then on the other side, we have some uh, Metmast long-term um, uh, wind, wind uh, series information from the customer. And we combine this and we correct this and in what we call the remodeled farm, so the calibrated farm. And then, of course, we have to generate WRG files because it's uh, probably a limitation of the wind softwares on the user side. But it's very relevant for me to say that we don't correct WRG files, we correct wind speed fields, and then we generate WRG files, which of course are corrected, but we don't correct the WRG files directly, but the wind field first. So uh, in terms of validation, uh, just a brief summary of uh, what we've been able to uh, cross-check. Uh, there are two types of validation here. One is an internal validation we run, and then uh, some external results from uh, consultancies or customers that were open to validate our uh, farm in order to, uh, to provide, let's say, a pure clean validation that has not been uh, internally done on our side so that it's completely blind coming from customers. And uh, basically what we want to do here, we have a certain wind field generated by the model without any correction, but then we want to say, okay, what it, how will it will be if we run a calibration by using one Metmast and then we validate the other one. So it's a blind cross test validation, validation set uh, st strategy where we want to, we validate it internally. And we did this validation by using always 
two pair metmas, so metmas A, metmas B. So we correct with we scale everything with metmas A, and then we validate metmas B and vice versa. And we do that for a certain number of sites. I I don't know exactly the number of sites here. I think it was about twenty sites approximately. So uh, so it's about forty event masts, so twenty uh, blind crossed data sets, and we basically came up with a, a conclusion. Uh, this is a brief summary of the results. So this is uh, the, the wind speed uh, mean absolute error or mean absolute bias in meter per second once the validation has been done only for the uh, blind test um, uh, metmast. So that means that on these um, about 20 sites that we validated internally, uh, where we had 20 paired, 40 metmasts, uh, this is this 0 0.4, almost 0 0.4 meter per second um, uh, deviation or error is what we get as a blind test uh, cross check. So pretty interesting to see that indeed we are able to, uh, by using one metmast, we are able to correct the other one uh, pretty nicely. So uh, interesting. And also the variable parameter, uh, the shape parameter, so that means the, the Q of the distributions, which is very relevant for the high wind speed beams, uh, it's also pretty pretty cute, the accuracy. So it's, it's 0 0.1 on the deviation. We are talking a parameter that is usually on the order of two or three. So this is pretty good, right? So, and um, we, we, we were also satisfied with the fact that Indeed, by using one man mask, all the corrections, or let's say 80% of the corrections, almost all of the corrections were in the good direction. Of course, it can happen that by correcting by using one man mask, the other one goes the other way around. Uh, this is, of course, in complex sites, it can be that you are overestimating one of the man masks, but the other one is underestimated. And then, of course, if you correct that, corrections sometimes are not in the right direction, but we consider that compared to other software such as a WASP or OpenWin or similar softwares, this is pretty interesting and pretty uh, a good a, a good uh, let's say a percentage of uh, of um, let's say of uh, correction. So um, and then for the wind direction, all results were very satisfactory. Uh, we think that this is a good consequence of not using any number of sectors. We don't use any twelve or sixteen sectors for the correction because we are creating wind fields before any sectorizing. And this is interesting to see that indeed the direction really shifts in the good direction. And also the, the, the shape parameter, as I was mentioning, uh, it, it's really interesting to see that it does a much better job than other linear softwares, linear softwares where you don't correct the wind speed, but directly the wind distributions. And it's much more difficult to really um, determine how the viable shape parameter should be corrected if you don't correct the wind but directly the wind distribution parameters. So interesting to see that uh, indeed for this internal validation, we were satisfied. Uh, we considered that this is pretty interesting to see that uh, this calibration method adds value to the wind resource analysis. And of course, in the external validation done by other customers, we got pretty similar results. It was a pretty similar strategy. Man must A, man must B, then cross check the blind test uh, results. And uh, we were also doing the same strategy. We want to get a new wind field once it has been calibrated. And as a summary, uh, we got a similar, uh, let's say, 6% deviation once the MET masts have been calibrated, uh, pretty similar to what we got internally in meter per second. It was about 0 0.4 meter per second. If you think in percentage, this is pretty similar uh, with... Uh, uh, when compared to a mean wind speed of, let's say, a seven or eight meter per second. So, so pretty interesting to see that also the external validation got similar results. So, uh, so as a summary, and I will uh, finish up with this, uh, we consider that our farm uh, is, uh, is a good tool for generating wind resource grid files at high resolution, but still they can have a more added value if they are corrected by using measurements on our side because we are able to uh, generate multiple met mass correction where we are able to correct wind fields more than wind distributions. And also we are able to understand a little bit how the wind patterns are. And that uh, gives us more, more information in order to determine how far the correction should go, how relevant each of the met masts is in terms of weight, 
when you are calibrating, which is always a pain on the user side. And we consider that we have more information to perform that in a more, uh, let's say, uh, analytical or scientific way. So, uh, so uh, this is a little bit it. So uh, thanks for the attention. And I will uh, move into the next speaker. I think Edvald is your turn. Um, thank you, Pau. Uh, before we move to Edvald, uh, we have some questions for you, Pau. Uh, so we can answer them before, um, before moving. Um, I think it's um, um, someone was uh, was asking uh, Anne Kiet uh, if worth at hundred meter are you running worth in less model? If not, will not hundred meter be a problem for the PVL schemes? Uh, yep. Would you like it. to answer? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I can <laughs> you, see. You can see that. I can question. see the I can see the question, so it's it's good that you read them, but uh, it's also okay, good okay. Read them. It's, uh, <laughs> some of them are technical. So thanks. So a uh, uh, pretty interesting question indeed. Uh, this is for Worf. Uh, you know, uh, for the ones that have some Worf knowledge, indeed. Um, for the farm product, we don't use the LES mode, um, and it's of course it has been a long controversy in the old uh, days about. It, does it really add value to run worth at such high resolution? Because indeed the PBL schemes, the, the, the boundary layer schemes or other radiation schemes that are parameterized, indeed they are not fully solved at 100 meters. And but what we and we know we are aware of that. We know that we are kind of forcing the model into scales that maybe should be not uh, necessary or maybe they are not adding value in terms of uh, the cost of the computational that you dedicate to it, it's maybe not worth. But what we've seen is that the wind direction is much better if you run high resolution, even though the boundary layer schemes and radiation are parameterized. So still, if you are not solving fully the turbines, if you're not generating time series, which is something you have to remember that for this uh, farm product, we generate wind fields. And so we can uh, afford to uh, run the world at high resolution and still we are getting an improvement in the wind direction, even though the cost, maybe it's not worth, but uh, it's up to us and we decided internally that indeed it has, uh, it, it's really interesting to do that. So, uh, so the, yeah. Yeah, perfect, Paul. Uh, as you can read the the questions, if you want to yes. to answer yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some of them, it's just like uh, perfect three four minutes, and then we move to Edval. Perfect. I think the other ones are a little bit more quick, a little bit uh, shorter. But about the wasp software, we are able to deliver uh, the default deliverable for the farm is WRG files, which will not work on wasp because WRG files are output from wasp. But indeed, we are also able to extract results. Uh, tap files directly to be used in WASP if necessary, directly from our farm, because we are generating wind distributions. And then, of course, we are able to uh, deliver the tap format for WASP. So I don't know if that answered the questions. but uh, And then regarding the WARP schemes, uh, I think I answered a little, a little bit the question on the first one. Yes, we are running the boundary layer schemes and so on and so on at 100 meter resolution. And we've still seen that even though it's not the recommended resolution for WARP, um, and maybe we are overshooting the computational cost, it's still worth in terms of wind direction. So, um, yeah, uh, as I mentioned in our calibration, uh, yes, uh, the downsides of correcting viable parameters, which is of course what, let's say, uh, as a local software will do when rescaling WRG files, is that you don't know and knows, nobody knows how the viable parameters should be corrected if you want to correct the wind speed. Because um, the, the A and K parameters on the viable formula, the viable uh, law, are related to wind speed. And but, but of course, you don't know which one to touch if you want to calibrate wind speed. So all the softwares need to find an equilibrium between doing this. But of course, it's not clear exactly how to do this. And of course, you also suffer from the sectorizing. So if you do a calibration based on 12 sectors, you get different results when doing the calibration in 16 sectors. And that's a pity because the calibration shouldn't have anything to do with the number of sectors. It's just a physical magnitude. So it's a pity that you're limited because of sectors. So that, that's why we don't like to do that on the viable side. And um, Okay, we can answer the last question and then we oh, move perfect. to, to Edval. 
Okay, and then uh, if we if we have time at the end of the of the presentation yes. from Elba, then we can continue. Otherwise, we will for sure uh, answer all these questions and send them to you, of course. Perfect. Uh, for the uh, for the bias, I think that in the internal validation, it's indeed it was not indeed shown, but for the external one, there was a small. Uh, uh, number about it's very small the bias it's minus 0.2 percent so it's so it's almost uh null so you can assume that the model uh, this is something uh, recognized that the bias model does not have a bias over the world of course there are some locations where there is bias but then uh, it compensates on a global scale so this is a good sign for the model and the standard deviation i will look for it and uh, make sure that we can send it afterwards uh, but it's also pretty small in the order of five percent or something so this is telling us that indeed the model is able to generate not very large outliers okay great uh yeah then let's move to etval and uh, the you win uh, part and uh, thank you very much pao yeah thank you very much pao this was indeed very interesting uh, i think you touched upon many Questions actually that our users that you will uh, actually have, uh, the main involved in the calibration reports of using uh, the map or the series or the farm products was good you mentioning that. And probably I would encourage maybe to paste the link from your website where you have all these calibration reports. I think they're very interesting and, and very useful for the users to, to use directly in their own wind resource assessment reports. That will save a lot of time uh, from them uh, sort of moving forward. But a uh, very interesting topic indeed. Uh, I'm just sharing my screen now. I'm going through a presentation of UWIND. Um, I hope you can all see uh, the screen right here. So uh, the idea with the, uh, this sort of uh, webinar we're doing now here with, with Vortex is essentially showing the link between the two platforms. Uh, and uh, the main goal here is to have uh, the highest usability, uh, user friendliness when, when, uh, when when adapting the, the wind data tools uh, from uh, from Vortex into the UIN platform where it can be used uh, directly. And lucky enough, we are, uh, we've been working for quite some time, uh, especially uh, very good um, kudos to the development team here at UIN to adapting the farm product. Uh, this is a product that um, I, I personally have, uh, have been using for, for many different uh, occasions uh, for over the last years, it's uh, I would say probably the most validated one we, we can use in early stage screening before you have an enter into the measurement part of the big resource uh, assessment uh, in offshore wind. Uh, so we're very happy to, to introduce this uh, to our users um, uh, and it's a particularly interesting one when we enter into the, the details of using that. So, but for those of you that know you, we, we are a software as a service company. Uh, we uh, provide advanced tools in form uh, of a web-based platform. So it's, uh, it's everything is online, web-based, uh, that, that, that can be used to, to calculate yields, calculate costs, calculate uh, uh, different types of electrical and, uh, and uh, structural components when you're dealing with offshore wind farms. And apart from that, also we touch upon the logistics optimization of, of, of uh, offshore wind farm optimization. It's a very high level introduction to, to you with, so we are a, a platform we aim to uh, use uh, already uh, live data to reduce the, uh, the, the screening time and optimization of your offshore wind project uh, up by 80%. We do that by integrating wind data and GIS uh, access. Basically, we adapt the, the, different, uh, the different restrictions you might have on the human environmental restrictions on, on various parts, and then we use data uh, link from Vortex uh, to optimize the, the layout and calculate what we call and deliver a bankable wind report when, when doing that. All the users can use the predefined assets or predefined libraries we have uh, in our platform. We update these libraries every month and we provide actually high confidentiality and our own wind expertise as we're all wind experts that have developed this tool and we have developed this tool by us for other wind uh, experts in, in the field. So I won't go into detail about what is UWIND, OptiWind, Optixel, and Pixel Park, but essentially they, they cover uh, the questions on what is the technical and cost simulation, what is uh, uh, logistics and installation optimization have to do with when you're doing with uh, when you're dealing with offshore wind farm uh, analysis, and then what we'll focus on today is the area screening, uh, visualization, and the optimal layout generation. So the when you're doing with area screening, and I'll show you how that works inside the platform. So primarily, you were we were dividing into two tasks. So 
One is the macro analysis where you have a very large area and you want to adapt the different restrictions you might have on that area, including bathymetry, uh, soil conditions, distance to brick, distance to harbor, and then mainly what is the wind speed in the area. So you do that to try to compile the, the polygons you might want to want to adapt for offshore or for onshore uh, sites and to finding the optimum in terms of LCOE or levelized cost of energy or essentially just how, uh, what's the capacity you might actually have to install in the area. So we jump from there, so the macro analysis and you're adapting basically the shape of your polygon, the capacity you might put into the micro uh, screening, which is basically a layout generator where you optimize the layout based on spacing criteria. You try to maximize the gross production, minimizing the weight losses and blockage, and then try to optimize the overall uh, yield on, on, on the site. Uh, so we'll focus on these two parts today to show you. And now we're basically presenting uh, within you in the, the overall link where we have uh, where we have already sort of established and tested over the last few months with our, with our users is the farm product integration. So now we have went, gone from this macro analysis into let's say the micro analysis in terms of layout generation with one micro distribution per site meaning there was no horizontal extrapolation. And then what we adapted now is basically adapting the farm products. So we get the 100 meter resolution and we're adapting the spatial variation within the site. So the overall layout optimization and the yield analysis you get is a, a lot higher quality using these data sets. And what we dare to say is already uh, said uh, is the sort of the, the most important step to have done before uh, developers or authorities start the wind resource analysis in terms of putting a buoy uh, out there and doing a, a measurement campaign. Um, it's then, as Paul mentioned, something that it could also be used to calibrate the measurements and continue using to finalize uh, the, the FIT report that you would need as, as, a, as, a, as, as a developer uh, finalizing a bankable wind resource assessment. So now we're adapting to, to analyzing this. Our yield optimizer basically, as I said, maximizes the growth, minimizes the weight, and generates this bankable wind resource assessment using these data sets. You can also always visualize the wind farm, visualize the offshore substation, visualize the cables uh, by simply downloading uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the data sets into 3D. And basically by doing that, you're maximizing the yield, but you're also focusing on in new wind, the costs. So basically a cost is a function of the bathymetry, the soil conditions, the distance to shore, the distance to grid. And we calculate also within you with these foundation weights, the electrical losses, um, and basically combining everything into an overall calculation as, as such. So by integrating farm, uh, we're actually very happy to, to do that. Um, so what we get here is a, is a data at 100 meter resolution. And um, I would say, and probably this also mentioned before, uh, it's a, probably the most complete uh, modeling product that you have on the market. You are generating this long-term statistics and at the exact hub height that you can retrieve, uh, which is very useful for, for the user. So you get also the temperature, uh, you get the air density, you get uh, the turbulence intensity, and you get the extreme wind speeds basically in, in one, one sort of setup. So it's a very useful thing for wind resource analysts to adapt these, uh, these data sets coming directly from Vortex. And now what we've done is, is actually bridging this uh, in between and, and uh, allowing the user just to adapt it directly into you and, be used directly. So now no need for downloading it and uploading it and then trying it and trying to visualize it by one button. You simply adapt everything and you finalize the calculation from uh, from one platform to the other. But essentially inside UWIND, so when you're using the, the WRG files, you get essentially the high, much higher resolution of the wind data available. And you get each for each turbine position their own wind rows and as a 16 uh, sector wipeout distribution um, that we also use to calculate the AAP. So all this is essentially taken into account when we're doing the AAP calculations. So from here, I'll, I'll jump over to show you how, how this essentially works inside the, um, the platform itself. So as before I mentioned, we are discussing how you can do a, a macro analysis going into a micro analysis. So we're using this sort of uh, setup here in, in, uh, in the Celtic C just, just to show as a, as a reference. So you can start off by saying that if there is no spatial uh, maritime spatial planning in place, let's say this is an area we would have an open door tender, which many countries will have uh, moving, moving forward, then you can simply say draw up a very big polygon or import a polygon. And then inside UWIN, we essentially extract the data sets 
where we calculate and uh, and show the wind speed at half height. We show the, the bathymetry. We show the area of each uh, each part, and we're already calculating and connecting each area to the nearest grid point and to the nearest harbor. And then we're calculating. Uh, the installation time, the O&M time, the overall electrical losses appointed with uh, with uh, linking this uh, this uh, each part, and basically by doing that you can simply screen and evaluate what sort of things you want don't want to see inside the area. So you can also filter out which sort of uh, which sort of uh, which sort of uh, bathymetry you don't want to see, which sort of uh, LCOE you want to avoid. Uh, what sort of wind speeds you want to focus on, etc. So let, let's say we call this the, the, the overall macro analysis. And then let's say if we are moving to, from this into what we call the micro analysis, then we're lucky enough that the Crown Estates in the UK has already sort of made this uh, screening. And they've already said that within these uh, areas, there will be uh, a tender moving forward around five slash six. I hope it will be a part of the the AR6 that was recently announced there will be a higher subsidy uh, moving forward. Um, and then when you're having these areas already accounted for, then we, there's no need to do the macro analysis, but we need to do what we basically call uh, the, the project evaluation in terms of, uh, of the area. So you simply jump from, uh, from here. So um, now we're basically connected directly to my account at, at Vortex. I have been lucky enough to have the grid file here from Vortex to, to do this analysis. So I can simply jump from here uh, into uh, connecting this then to, to the UWIC platform. And then as I already have these areas, I'm basically extracting the wind data for these particular areas here. So if I click on this part here, I can see exactly for this area for a wind farm capacity of, uh, of one and a half gigawatts, what is my uh, estimated production? What is the bathymetry in the area? Which, uh, which, how large is it? What's the density, etc.? And then I can get all the information here as well, connecting this to the grid point and to the actual harbor. I also get per area, and this is also applicable here inside Pixel. So per Pixel, you also get the soil condition. The soil condition and the bathymetry are especially important when doing both fixed bottom and for uh, floating wind farms. So you can simulate the additional cost this might have when you uh, were installing or operating uh, the platform in different uh, different conditions. So jumping from here into, let's say, the, the still macro analysis, we still have the overall uh, view, uh, but now we need to evaluate what sort of uh, what sort of micro analysis can we adapt inside the, the inside the platform. So I can simply go here to the park layout design. The park layout design is actually uh, where I can I can calculate and simulate the overall uh, production based on uh, now importing the, 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 the farm product. So I can either, uh, wait for the UV users, now this is adapted already uh, on production. So when you're, when you're locked into your Vortex platform and you have access to a, a grid file, then by simply importing it and, uh, and connecting it to the UV platform, you will get a small tick box here. When you tick this here, then you will have an overview of the different uh, grid files that you that you can use for uh, your overall screening. So right now, right here, I'm just looking at the, the PDA3 site, which is the site uh, that has been out, out here, sort of in the, in, in the southeast. And by adapting that, I simply get this farm product that is essentially the same one as I have here from the Vortex platform. So this part product then is that, as said before, as a hundred meter resolution, I get all the wind data automatically here. And for each position, you can see here as a turbine ID, uh, what's the exact bathymetry and what's the mean free wind speeds um, at the exact hub height for this position. You can then download the data sets of the weight induced wind speeds. And then you can essentially see what sort of impact the, the weight losses have, uh, have at each other. So this is a set, something very, very important for, 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 for the users to adapt because here you get uh, for a very large area, you can see the sort of the spatial variation between of, of the exact wind speeds. And that's uh, something that is very important when you're doing this, uh, this overall analysis. Something very important also here when you're doing with floating wind, you also get the boring footprint radius. So when you have the different uh, restrictions on a layout, let's say a cable buffer or an offshore substation, or the area where the anchors of floating cannot hang, cannot be as a part of the area, then you can also just scoop in and say here what sort of constraint you want for your layout to be a part of the, the overall analysis. And now, as you can do this per 100 meters, it's uh, extremely useful 
when uh, when when you're doing the the layout design. So moving from from here, we can also do this. So let's say if you want to try out a scenario where you have the, this was a 15 megawatt. So let's say if you want to try out a scenario with a 20 megawatt, uh, and let's see you want to try out to see what sort of impact it will have moving 10 meters up in hub height. Uh, if you have a 20 megawatt turbine, probably this would be uh, let's say the standard as hub height. Then you can also adapt and see what sort of impact this will have on the overall yield and this is sort of free wind speed at, uh, at, at each position. So let's say this is a, 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 a 20 megawatt case. And then what is very important is that uh, for the Celtic Sea, as you have here three areas um, on basically focusing on the, the dominated wind direction. So you can do it here, basically you can add uh, the different um, uh, the different um, neighboring wind farms. So let's say we want to add here PDA1 and PDA2. So then this is basically saying that we want to add the neighboring wind farms as a part of the, the analysis. So let's start with PDA2 uh, here. So we're simply adding uh, this particular wind farm and then we're using this to calculate what's the overall um, internal and external wake effect within, within the areas. And this is, of course, very useful when you're doing this sort of build out of simulations of neighboring wind farms. You need to sort of try to visualize and, and try to calculate what type of turbine and what sort of evaluation you might you get for, for these areas. And this is also something very useful um, uh, for the users to know that as we have, a, for example, a grid for this particular area here, you can also, I think Paul also mentioned that you can also get a grid file with a much larger area, I think up to 4,000 square kilometers. That can also be used to have even more accurate uh, sort of uh, evaluation of the neighboring wind farms. Um, so uh, when you do that, then basically you're taking the wind data essentially here also at 100 meter resolution from the neighbors. And uh, for what we like to do at UWind is that even if you don't have it, you won't have an error. We'll, uh, we'll, make, a, we'll make an assumption of the free wind speeds of these wind farms. And, uh, and then that's used for, for, for the overall analysis. So this is for the PDA uh, one and PDA two added as well. Then you can see when you have the different wind farms added, then the overall sort of uh, internal and external weight loss will also be affected. But using uh, this, you can also jump into and see what sort of uh, impact might it have if I have a very sort of uh, dense layout and sort of dense borders, irregular layout, or what happens actually if I move all the turbines into the high wind area and what impact might that have? Even though I have a higher weight loss, do I also have a better business case if I'm just focusing on this area? So, what part of the the optimizer in, in the, the layout design is also you can also try to focus on that. But it can also, as you see here, the different weight losses in between. You can also move the turbines around and play around with it uh, inside the, the analysis. And then this sort of manually, you also get sort of an evaluation what might be the different uh, inputs on on this. And to summarize everything, um, this was uh, obviously a very <laughs> brief introduction to uh, the link between farm and, and you and how we can you it, uh, use it. Uh, but uh, as a summary here, as we are capturing all the wind data, all the cost data, all the, the um, all the loss uh, and availability data, you can also use, use this directly to compare the different projects. So let's say here we're analyzing the different uh, different components here. So. We're using a one and a half gigawatt of a 20 megawatts, and then uh, another layout that is a compact layout, uh, dense borders focusing on the high wind areas. And we're comparing that to uh, a 15 megawatt uh, analysis. So we can simply add that as a part of the scenario overview and scenario uh, comparison. If you jump here into uh, efficiencies, you'll see the different efficiencies between the project, both for external and uh, external wake effects. We go here and cover all the budgets. So basically, what every single item cost, cost calculated per position, and calculated even if you have one or two substations, it also takes into account the cable lengths and the cable losses directly to that. And as a summary, you will have here what are the financial indicators. So what is the LCOE comparison in between uh, these uh, these layouts? And you can even go even further and looking into what are the cash flows uh, related to these, and what sort of payment schedules, what sort of uh, uh, what sort of um, internal rate of return or what sort of uh, um, what sort of debt to equity ratio might you get? So basically, what we try to establish here is to give the user the full experience of, of these optimizations uh, through using the both platforms. I think that was more or less it. I hope I haven't passed the time, uh, Patricia, on this. No, no you haven't. <laughs> okay, just, great. Just, just some time.
Um, we, have, <laughs> we have a few minutes to answer some of, of the questions uh, regarding you win. I think Claudia was uh, was also answering some of them. But Claudia, if you want to, if you if you have read them, and you want to, you or Edval want to answer um, any of these questions, we have just uh, like four or five minutes. And then um, the remaining questions, we we will we will answer all of them, of course, and send a, a document to all of you. But yeah, Claudia. And um, all of the questions are for Edvald, so I'm gonna read it. Um, in the case of a hub height like 160 me 65 meters, how you win calculates the wind shear to extrapolate it from vortex area that are at whole numbers, 160, 170. For instance, yeah, we we um, we have a scaling factor that goes to it. You can also add the, the roughness factor, rough, roughness coefficient to uh, to validate for that. But there's a there's a if if not if you don't have the, the exact um, um, exact shear coefficient, sorry, and to account for that, then there's a simple uh, calibration between the two heights that we use. Right. And what sort of weight model can we use for AAP optimization? In the, inside you, there are two weight models, both uh, the NOE engine uh, weight model, but also Turbo Park uh, weight model that, that can be used. The weight model of NOE engine, you can adapt also the weight uh, decay coefficient directly um, or use a one that, that is simply to, uh, derived directly from the, the turbulence intensity. Or for Turbo Park, you can also adapt at the, directly the uh, TI, so the turbulence intensity as a part of the um, uh, the Turbo Park weight model that, that, is, uh, that is used. Mm -hmm. Another question. Is it possible to use in the park layout design the WRD to use its speed ups plus the tap frequency table from an uploaded time series? Yes, it's also possible. You can adapt both. And it's easy and fast. <laughs> yeah, and can you make a park layout for floating turbines taking into account the marine line interdistance? Yeah, so you can you can adapt that directly. So it takes into account all the mooring line um, design as well, if it's TLP or catenary uh, um, lines. And it takes into account also as a function of bathymetry, but you can also adapt the function of soil conditions as well. Um, and then you can really sort of optimize the layout, taking into account that there are no uh, there are no restrictions that are are we're not sort of covering and, and that such. Mm -hmm. Reading some other questions, there are a lot of questions. Uh, is the layout optimization to maximize the AAP a kind of gradient based optimizer? Is it done through several iterations and comparing the results? Uh, you can do both. You can have, let's say, uh, what what we normally use, uh, what the normal users of you would use is to have, let's say, a layout made, and then you can have also um, uh, analysis done uh, as well to to maximize this uh, and only focusing on this part. And you can either decide to do it on AP, but also on a cost level. So if you want to take into account the bathymetry and, and distance to to grid distance to shore, you can also do that uh, inside. We have time. So, sorry, yeah, Claudia. We have time for a, for a, one more question, maybe, because uh, yeah, a couple of minutes more. Thank you. Yeah, there is one question for Vertex. Uh, what formula do you use for calibrating your wind field? Do you want to answer this, Carl? Yeah, which question is it? Because I cannot find it. Sorry. Uh, the one from Frank. Uh, one of the latest questions. What formula do okay, you use for calibrating your wind speed? Okay, so what kind of strategy in terms of a uh, numerical strategy? Yeah, I was answering this one just now on the on the on the chat. Uh, we we do use uh, basically it's it's a tool that we created ourselves. It's 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 like uh, let's say it's it's a multivariate strategy where we basically. Uh, calculate the deviations of wind speed of our model when compared to observations and then we apply a decrease uh, area of impact 
it's a blending strategy. So you basically blend, modify slightly the model results so that it, they will match the measurements. It's a most uh, strategy. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I think um, we we should we should finish now because uh, our forty five minutes, as as we say at the beginning. So <laughs> let's be um, punctual. So um, yeah, thank you very much for all of you for attending today's webinar. As as we say, we will share the recording and we we also share the slides that we we have presented in this webinar. Uh, also the Q&A, um, the, the answers to the questions and some other documents uh, about farm, the validation and the remodeling. So the